We've been covering the global rise of the far right on this show for some time. There is, of course, Vladimir Putin and his ties to far right groups in Russia and beyond. But we've also discussed people like Hungary's Viktor Orban and Marine Le Pen getting more than 40% of the vote in the French election over the weekend. They're all kind of familiar and somewhat connected even. But if you think these leaders are bad, you need to meet India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. He and his far right Hindu nationalist party, the BJP, are bent on creating a lost Hindu kingdom. They call it the Hindu Rashtra. They've been in office since 2014, openly championing Hindu nationalist supremacist ideology. Scholars are now literally warning about genocide there. Minorities, from Christians to Muslims and beyond, are facing the greatest threats to their existence since India became independent in 1947. In fact, speaking of independence, remember Mahatma Gandhi? In 1948, he was assassinated by a Hindu extremist, a man named Naturam Godse. Godse was a former member of the far-right Hindu nationalist paramilitary volunteer group known as the Rashtriya Swayam Savek Sangh, or RSS. Imagine if the world's white supremacists had one organized paramilitary group where they could all train together and get politically organized. Yeah, exactly. Founded in 1925, they were really into the politics of Mussolini and Hitler, the RSS. A senior founding member wrote about how he was inspired by Nazi Germany, which displayed, quote, race pride at its highest and was a good lesson for use in India. The extremist ideology binding the RSS is a kind of Hindu supremacy and nationalism known as Hindutva, which, to be clear, should not be confused with the religion of Hinduism. Hinduism good, Hindutva not so good. In fact, Hindutva ideology has been really influential among some of the worst people, and not just in India. If you remember the Muslim-hating, far-right Norwegian mass murderer Anders Breivik, the man who massacred 77 people in Norway in 2011, he cited Hindutva in his 1,500-page manifesto, pledging support for the deportation of all Muslims from India. He says that far-right Islamophobic movements in Europe and India should, quote, learn from each other because, quote, our goals are more or less identical. He even put a link to the RSS website in the online resources section of his manifesto. You get the idea, right? This is a group and an ideology that is really scary. But what's even more frightening is how politically successful they've been. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is a man in charge of leading a country of 1.4 billion people, almost four and a half times the US population. He's been re-elected as prime minister, and yet he was a longtime organizer in the RSS and is now head of the RSS's political party affiliate, the BJP. It shouldn't come as a surprise that Modi and his party, the BJP, were in charge of the state of Gujarat during the horrific 2002 riots there. For a second day, Hindu mobs attacked Muslims in towns across the western state of Gujarat. Despite a shoot-to-kill orders issued to police in one village, Hindus set fire to Muslim homes, killing 30 people. Witnesses say the police stood by and watched as crowds burned Muslim-owned stores, hotels, and restaurants. In one village, 27 Muslims died when angry mobs set their homes on fire. In another village, seven Muslims were burned to death in a bakery. It's estimated that between one to 2,000 people were killed in Gujarat, the vast majority of the Muslims. Many Muslim women were even raped. Western researchers have called it a one-sided systemic pogrom backed by the BJP. Human rights groups, both Indian and international, also say Modi and his local government were complicit. Some even say the riots might have been premeditated. Even the US government seemed to recognize Modi's culpability at the time, banning him from coming to the United States. Until, of course, he became prime minister in 2014. And then, well, we were pretty much buddies again. Barack Obama even wrote Modi's 2015 Time 100 article calling him a reformer in chief. If Obama mainstreamed Modi and everything he represented, Trump took him to the altar and tied the knot, marrying the far right politics of the world's two biggest democracies. Here in Houston, Texas, thousands attended the 2019 Howdy Modi rally, AKA the Trump Modi Love Fest. I present to you my friend, a friend of India, a great American president, Mr. Donald Trump. Prime Minister Modi is doing a truly exceptional job for India and for all of the Indian people. For all of the Indian people? For all of them? 
since his coming into office, since Modi came into office, hate crimes against minorities have skyrocketed, from Dalits to Christians and most of all towards Muslims. Lynchings. Yeah, lynchings of Muslims rumored to have eaten or even transported cows, a holy animal for Hindus. Muslims being hacked to death while their attackers chant anti-Muslim slogans. Extremist priests calling for the rape of Muslim women. As the BBC put it last year, unprovoked attacks on Muslims by Hindu mobs have become routine in India, but they seem to evoke little condemnation from the government. This Modi government is complicit in all of this. Last week, authorities in Delhi took nine bulldozers through a city and destroyed parts of a mosque while people were inside and razed dozens of homes and commercial buildings most belonging to Muslims. Modi's government also claims almost two million Muslims whose families originally came from Bangladesh generations ago aren't rightful citizens of India. And if they can't prove they are, they'll be sent to what the government calls transit camps. These are mass detention centers that critics have likened to concentration camps with boundary walls, watchtowers. There are already six of them with thousands of detainees. Behind every shocking supremacist policy, you'll find shocking supremacist rhetoric. It's the same in India. A survey from one of India's prominent news channels found that hate speech from politicians skyrocketed by 500% under Modi's leadership. Modi's right-hand man, Home Minister Amit Shah, described migrants from neighboring Bangladesh as termites at a 2019 campaign rally. A man who may likely succeed Modi as prime minister is Yogi Adityanath, currently in charge of India's largest state, which has a population almost the size of the US. He said India's top Muslim actor is no different to a terrorist. He's called Muslim lawmakers a green virus infecting the country. One count found more than 100 instances of hate speech and mentions of Hindutva in Adyanath's speeches from last November till February. And it's not just the BJP. Have a listen to Pooja Shankun Pandey, a leader of another Hindu nationalist group back in December. This is dark stuff. A reminder that when we talk about the far right, it's not just the white far right. When we talk about supremacist ideology, it's not just white supremacy. There is a global far right movement. Hindutva is part of it. And while some in the West have been keen to call out the Orbans and Le Pens and Putins of this world, not many of them say a word about what Modi is up to. Joe Biden even invited the Indian Prime Minister to his democracy summit at the White House in December. What will it take for Western governments to speak out on this issue? How many more Indian Muslims or Christians need to die? Joining me now to discuss all of this is Gregory Stanton. He taught genocide studies at George Mason University, and he's the founder and director of the nonprofit Genocide Watch. In January, he told a U.S. congressional briefing that there were early signs and processes of genocide against Muslims in India. And award-winning Indian journalist Rana Ayub, she's arguably India's most famous Muslim journalist, but has been harassed and targeted by the Indian government to the point where a group of U.N. experts urged the Modi government to leave her alone. She receives death threats and worse for her investigative reporting covering the prime minister and his party. They've tried to block her from flying out of India in the past, but she's thankfully and safely now made it to the US. Thank you both for joining me. Rana, let me start with you. People abroad look at India as the world's biggest democracy, a multicultural, multi-faith nation, a thriving economy, a Western ally. They find it hard to believe that things there are that bad. What do you say to them? How bad is it in your view? Well, Mehdi, if things got bad after Narendra Modi was elected as Prime Minister in 2014, I can say this with absolute confidence that the last three weeks uh, when Ramadan began in India, it has been a, probably a nightmare for every Indian Muslim. You wake up every morning to see the worst of hate crimes, hate speech spoken against Muslims, or uh, Hindu supremacists uh, on our television screens chanting Jai Shri Ram. Uh, perched on top of a mosque, planting a saffron flag, uh, dancing with swords and guns, asking for uh, a genocide of Muslims, a Hindu priest asking for a gang rape of Muslims. He's arrested and within weeks he's let out on bail. I mean, it's claustrophobic and it's even more claustrophobic to arrive here in the U.S. and to have people live in some kind of denial about this because I had some I have been speaking to some of the top editors and policy makers in the U.S. and they, there is this comfortable and convenient ignorance about what's happening in India. Partly because there has been this huge propaganda PR campaign by Narendra Modi of projecting to the world that he is some he is probably a, a yeah. Mahatma Gandhi incarnate, but he's not one. 
He is nowhere close also, you to have... Mahatma Gandhi. On the contrary, his ministers and people from his political party worship Nathuram Godse and honor Nathuram Godse, who was the assassin of Mahatma Gandhi. And that has been mainstreamed in India. Also, you have a lot of big American companies, of course, Rana, that want to do business in India, and therefore it's convenient uh, to look away from the bad news that you're reporting. Gregory, Rana there mentioned the G word, genocide. Uh, it's a term, as you know better than anyone, that isn't, it's an uneasy bar to meet. We throw it around a lot. For example, in Ukraine right now, there's a debate about it. That there are but there are specific criteria that need to be met to actually label a situation genocide. You predicted the Rwandan genocide years before it was called, I know. Why are you warning of that possibility in India now? How close are we to actually getting to the legal definition of genocide there? Well, we see genocide as a process rather than an event. Uh, and what we've learned from studying other genocides is the process is quite predictable. It's not inexorable. It can be stopped. But... In order to stop it, you have to recognize it. And so a lot of the early warning signs of genocide are already there. The uh, Indian population is classified into uh, Muslims and Hindus and other groups. Uh, you have uh, discrimination against Muslims. You have a dehumanization of Muslims, like when uh, Shah called them termites. You have a whole raft of polarization uh, laws that have been passed, the Citizenship Amendment Act that, you know, gives special preference to other religions, but who come from other countries, but not to any Muslims. You have um, actual preparation in which, for instance, as you pointed out in your very good uh, summary of what's happening there, uh, you actually have Hindu priests in a very large meeting calling for genocide, actually calling for people to arm themselves with weapons to yes. kill Muslims. That's what you call yeah. incitement to commit genocide. That's why we are yes. warning. And we think that India is pretty close. You've already got what we call the persecution stage, we which is the stage right before genocide. We played a short clip there from that event that you mentioned. It is deeply disturbing. Ron, I have to ask, how do you continue? You've received so many threats against your own life, violent, disturbing threats in a place where extremist groups have actually been able to carry out horrifying atrocities with impunity, um, where journalists have been assaulted and even killed. How do you find the courage to continue doing what you do? Well, actually, Mehdi, it's not just, it's not courage at all. It's just basically, I do not have any option because the 220 million Muslim population in India is looking at the privileged voices who have a global audience, who uh, you know, who have who have a position of privilege to speak up for for them. At this point of time, even some of the top Muslim celebrities in India, the Khans of the Bollywood, uh, you don't even hear them speak. And I was, uh, you were playing the footage of the Gujarat genocide in which more than a thousand Muslims were killed. I was there in Gujarat when the Gujarat genocide was taking place. I was 19. I was a relief worker. I can tell you these what is taking place in India. It, this is exactly playing out in the way Gujarat played out. Everybody said, wow. what was Narendra Modi's involvement in the Gujarat genocide? Well, Narendra Modi's involvement was when there was a mob on the street, when leaders were giving anti-Muslim hate speech, he continued to be silent. There was no arrest. The cops looked the other way. The bureaucracy looked the other way. Look at it now. For the last three weeks since Ram Navmi, the Hindu festival, there has been mob attack, mob violence, hate speech against Muslims. And the prime minister, who's quite media savvy, very social media yeah. savvy, has just put one That's tweet, a, I, just one tweet saying, one I need communal yeah. harmony in this country. So, and trust me, things would have stopped. Because oh yes. his, suddenly you have, and it's not, it doesn't stop at that. There is a call for stopping. Silence, his silence, more, I think, Rana... You're right to point out that his silence speaks volumes. Uh, Gregory, before we run out of time, how much are Western governments complicit in all of this? Obama and Trump were pals with Modi. Biden invited Modi to his democracy summit last December. Boris Johnson, uh, sorry, last week, Boris Johnson was just there. I think we're very complicit because I think what we have here is the usual genocide denial by our leaders in which they want to look the other way. Uh, it is very similar to me to what, our leaders did in the 30s, in the 30s when Hitler was rising. We have here a man who could easily bring about a genocide in India, and we are ignoring it. 
Yeah, that is deeply, deeply troubling to leave. We'll have to end on. We'll have to end on that note. It's a dark note, but I'm glad that we were able to discuss this because not enough people talk about this topic. I appreciate you both coming on the show and informing our viewers.